Hi, I'm Karima Brown. It's Sunday and it's time for The Fix. Welcome to this edition of The Fix, where every Sunday we hold those in power to account. We tell you what matters, how it affects you and why you should care. Now, corrupt politicians are commonplace the world over, and South Africa is certainly no exception. In fact, corruption became more serious and targeted and calculated under former President Jacob Zuma when we experienced the phenomena of state capture, which was, of course, described by some academics as akin to a coup, with key state institutions being repurposed for the private financial gain of Zuma, his family, and his friends. But Zuma was removed through active citizenship when South Africans decided to fight back, which brings me to the book called Predator Politics, which narrates the harrowing story of one man's fight against corruption and a series of very powerful politicians, including our Deputy President David Mabuza, joining me to discuss uh, the book and the fight of Fred Daniel, uh, which is captured so eruditely in this, uh, you know, account, is the author of Predator Politics, Rayhana Rousseau. Rayhana, thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you as a guest. I was just telling my colleagues that you were my editor, uh, you know, in another life when we were both at Business Day. Um, this is, of course, you know, not knew what is recorded here in this book. Uh, Fred Daniel has won 22 attempts, uh, you know, in the um, fight against corruption uh, from politicians. What about Fred's story was so compelling for you that you left the works of fiction uh, to, you know, get us um, this book, which is an incredibly detailed account of uh, Fred Daniel's struggle uh, against corrupt politicians in Mpumalanga? Uh, what led me to the book was a very important date in Fred's life, which was a special trial which had been set down in the North Gauteng High Court for August to hear his claim of um, corruption and official ineptitude um, in a three-week trial that was supposed to be held. The book was coincided to, was supposed to coincide with the start of the trial, but then again, the trial didn't happen because once again, a senior politician in South Africa, Didi Mabuza, managed to get a case postponed. It seems to have been a strategy in those years, as you say, of Jacob Zuma's presidency, that when you try to hold them accountable in the courts, they seek postponement after postponement after postponement, rather than defend themselves against these charges. Absolutely. And then, of course, the irony of that is they are the first to cry foul and say, um, you know, they are not being tried properly and timelessly and that justice delayed is justice denied. I mean, like you say, a very well-known, um, you know, uh, a tactic. Rana, I must say, um, I read this book in one foul swoop. Um, and, of course, the details in here are incredible. Um, take the, uh, the viewer, uh, you know, through the essence of what, Fred Daniel's struggle uh, was about and why he took the extraordinary step to go to court to protect himself uh, from the man who is now today uh, the deputy president of South Africa. Fred Daniel is a businessman who's very passionate about the environment. Um, he had a successful business, he had a successful life in Johannesburg and decided that he was going to cash it all in and invest his money in a piece of land in South Africa, which he could use to teach citizens about the importance of combating climate change and using nature to heal the environment by itself. It was a wonderful project. Unfortunately, he chose Mpumalanga. Um, well, he bought 89 farms in Mpumalanga on which to establish his project. Um, he did it all legally. He investigated whether there was any land claims on the farms that he had bought. He found that they had none. And so he started investing millions of his own rands um, into this dream project of his. 
which was then completely and utterly stymied by low-level officials who were charged to help businesses grow in Mpumalanga, who were charged with helping to conserve, conserve the environment in Mpumalanga, and Fred found that they were blocking his applications for ordinary, normal paperwork that any conservationist would be entitled to. Um, they blocked him at every turn. It took him years to discover that the reason why they were blocking him was there was massive fraud mm. in the land claim process in Umpumalanga. He eventually blew the whistle on the land claims. None of these claims actually were direct threats at the time to his own land. He saw that um, people, poor, his poor neighbours in Umpumalanga who were entitled to restitution suddenly found that 50 million rand which had been made available to them for land restitution was being spent in a, wow, what is the word, reckless way. Um, the officials had um, were working alongside Africana businessmen to boost the prices, to, auto, to inflate the prices of farms that were being sold and that were supposed to go to poor, poor, poor black people um, in the area was being inflated by upwards of 2,000%. Mm. Fred blew the whistle on that and then found that there was systemic harassment, um, which he counted at every turn in the courts, won many court cases, but the only result was an increase in harassment. Absolutely, Rayana. You know, when I read that, I, my mind flashed back to all the interviews I did with senior government officials from Gwede Mantash to different, um, you know, uh, ministers of rural development and, and, and land affairs. Um, and the big thing, of course, is that a lot of what Fred uh, recounts is confirmed in the high-level report conducted by former President Khalima Mutlante, where he says that the issue isn't policy on land reform that is a problem. In fact, the policy is very pro-poor, very pro-black, very pro, um, in fact, accessing land. The problem is systemic and, um, you know, what he called um, deep level corruption. And I will never forget one of the interviews I did with Gwede Mantash in my push to get um, answers on why we can't get an audit of who owns what land in South Africa. Yeah. And Gwede Mantash consistently saying the reason reason for that is that the land prices are inflated. And of course, we saw from a policy perspective, uh, the ANC removing the willing buyer, willing seller, uh, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. aspect. And then later on taking the land um, evaluators out and saying they are actually part of the problem. And then setting up a, a national um, evaluator so that we could have a consistent price yeah. so that it's not unaffordable for the state to actually purchase land and, and give it to um, black South Africans that have been left out of the economy. And then later on, we can, of course, see how the emotive issue of land is being used by people like Didi Mabuza. In fact, in your book, um, I remember now as we're speaking, um, uh, Fred says that Mr. Mabuza called him and said, uh, you need to remember that land is a very emotional and difficult subject. And you need to, uh, and I'm paraphrasing now, you need to be, watch yourself, you need to be careful. And that's yes. uh, in one instance is one of the direct threats. Take um, our viewers into confidence, Rehana, and take us through when it is that Fred encounters Mr. Mabuza and um, what he says later on the book, in the book when Mr. Mabuza says uh, to um, um, one of his associates, according to Fred, that once he becomes the deputy president, he's going to make sure that Fred loses his land. Yeah. So... Um like I say, Fred bought 89 farms between Batplas and Barberton in southern Mpumalanga, um, which is Didi Mabuza's political fiefdom. Um, mm. he, the southern part of Mpumalanga was where he held most of the support during his rise to power in the province. Um, Fred, the, it is the weirdest thing. Didi Mabuza, when he was MEC for Land Affairs and Agriculture, um, established a parallel project called the Greater Bud Plus Land Claims Committee, where this, it seems the only objective of that organization was to intimidate white farmers into acceding 
to fraudulent, completely fraudulent land claims. Um, most of the land claims had been settled in the area when Fred started buying land. It, and then suddenly in 2008, new land claimants lodged claims. Um, the claims were, invest were, were not properly investigated. Um, Didi Mabuza's officials, it seems, did not do the verification, pro the verification process which the law insists on, but they accepted and gazetted all of these new claims by claimants who, it seems, didn't have a leg to stand on. So you have what you have here, what Fred first encountered was an MEC um, who was in charge of making sure that land reform was done according to the law, standing on a bucky outside his land, um, speaking to people who were toy-toying, who were th threatening to petrol bomb Fred's business, who had torn down kilometers of very expensive fencing, Didi Mabuza stands on the back of a bucky with a loud hailer and promises these people that Fred's land will soon be theirs. Um, it is shocking. It is absolutely shocking. Now, Rayana, the, the incredible thing, of course, here is the um, setting up of parallel structures. And, of course, Didi Mabuza's rise in the African National Congress coincides with what people talk about, the capturing of the ANC where branches are bought. In fact, uh, one of Mr. Mabuza's political adversaries in the province says that for every branch, there's a fake branch. For every member, yeah. there's a fake member. And they say that Mr. Mabuza, who was once an MEC for education, and had been sacked by Matthew Sposa for inflating the metric results, used the same formula for, um, uh, you know, uh, getting those fake results uh, to set up fake branches, fake organizations, yes. as you've just explained. And one of the things that struck me about this book was you were saying that in terms of population size, this is one of the smallest provinces in South Africa. But in 2017, it had the largest number of delegates at the deciding conference where Cyril Ramaphosa, of course, was elected uh, the president of the African National Congress and Mr. Mabuza um, at the last minute dumping in Kosazana Dlamini Zuma and, you know, stepping into that vacuum and becoming the second most powerful person on paper in South Africa. Um, Mr. Mabuza has denied all of this. In your writing of this book, uh, Rayhana, how did you treat Mr. Mabuza? Did you uh, ask for an interview? Did you go to court papers where he responded? I read, um, you know, comments from his spokesperson at various points and so on. But how do you deal with one, making sure that what Mr. Daniel said is factually true? And um, how did you make sure that you were also being fair to Mr. Mabuza? Being fair to Mr. Mabuza was not difficult because at every turn, um, Fred had used legal processes um, to try and get to, to try and build his business in Mpumalanga, mm -hmm. to defend his business against predator politics um, in the province. Um, so there was, oh, they, oh my, my, the biggest problem writing the book was the amount of material. Available. Yes, and what to leave out. Um, <laughs> and what to leave out. Yes. Believe you me, the version that you read is about a quarter of the length of the original version that I wrote. Um, I had to leave lots of material out mm. um, in order to stick to Fred's story. This is not a book about Didi Mabuza. This is a book about Fred Daniel. Mm. I set out to write a book about Fred Daniel. Um, the North Gauteng High Court... Um, Giving a citizen a special trial is not something that's easy to come by. Yes. Um, you have to persuade a court that there is grounds for this hearing. You have to persuade the court that for three weeks they will make time to hear um, your arguments. Um, so we were waiting all along for Didi Mabuza's responding affidavits. Mm -hmm. um, Didi Mabuza is the most senior politician um, in Fred's claim for damages of more than one billion rand mm. as a result of the political harassment that he faced in Mpumalanga. Um, we were waiting for them to file responding affidavits. Um, I would have given their responding affidavits full coverage in the paper, but they remained silent. Um, they kept sending lawyers to the court to look for spurious grounds on which this case could be thrown out. They never responded to the substance of Fred's claim. Um, the minute they respond to the substance of Fred's claim, believe you me, I will publish it. But in the 15 years that the saga has dragged on, Didi Mabuza has issued many press statements. Um, he has spoken a lot about Fred. And on every instance where he did, I have included it in the book. And, of course, the key issue is that that trial was set down for the 20th of August, 2020. 
2020. Um, and it never happened. So legally, Rayhana, where are we now? Legally, Fred is waiting for a new date. Um, Mike Helens came to the courts. Mike Helens came with all kinds of spurious arguments about why this trial should not be held on the date that the court had set aside and managed to get the matter postponed. Um, Fred is waiting for a date. He and his legal team are ready to go to court. I must say, though, that um, a damages claim for one billion rand is certainly going to be historic in mm. South Africa. But Fred's not really concerned about the money. What he's looking for is protection from the court so that he can return to Mpumalanga and continue with his project. Um, he's willing to set aside the issue of damages for now. He wants the court to ensure that he's able to build relationships with officials in Mpumalanga so that he can return to his project. That's okay. what he wants. Final question, Rehana. Um, a lot of people will argue, why is a rich businessman going to the court to seek protection from South Africa's deputy president? Take us through how many people has been assassinated that you record in the book as a consequence of um, politicians there trying to muscle ill in on deals, trying to strip people of their land and trying to essentially, um, you know, get a piece of the economic action through fraudulent and nefarious means. Yeah. Um, so um, as far as records go, there have been 22 assassinations in Mpumalanga as a result of political corruption. Um, Fred faced so many attacks on himself. Um, his wife was, um, yeah, she, she, she faced threats as well. Their 10-year-old child faced threats as well. Um, none of them succeeded, but they definitely believed and they were advised that... Um, they had to leave Mpumalanga um, in order for them to save their lives. And, and, yeah, it wasn't safe for them to remain in Mpumalanga any longer. Um, many business people in Mpumalanga have left the province never to return, and their businesses have been taken over by predator politicians. Um, it is a killing field. Um, politics in Mpumalanga has been a killing field for decades. All right, Rehana, on that chilling note, thank you so very much uh, for speaking to us. Of course, if you haven't read it, uh, get a copy. Predator Politics, a must read. And of course, uh, up next, we are looking at the balance of forces in South Africa as President Cyril Ramaphosa gets ready uh, to speak to the country next week about COVID-19, but most importantly, also as he battles those who are said to be fighting back against his efforts to clean up the African National Congress and state institutions. Stay with us.